brand new series called Challenge Accepted, and I'm excited about this because we're gonna be giving four unique challenges each week. It's gonna run throughout the entire month of June, and we're gonna be presenting four unique challenges, and here's the truth, I've said this for years, but God is not a forcer, he's a filler. So you do not have to accept the challenge, that's okay, uh, but if you choose to accept the challenge, this is our prayer. We believe that God wants to unlock some great things in and throughout your life. We always have a sticky statement, a little vision statement for what the series looks like, and this is the question that's asked for the series. How many of y'all are willing to step up when God says there's more? Come on, wave at me if you are, thank you for your overwhelming enthusiasm. No, come on. How many of y'all are willing to step up if God says there's more? We always have an anchor verse every week that we tie to the message that we're gonna be talking about. Today's anchor verse, it'll be on the screens, is found in Ecclesiastes chapter four, verses nine and 10. It says this, two people are better than one because they get more done by working together. Say working together. If one falls down, the other can help him up. But it's bad for the person who is alone and falls because there is no one there to help. For week number one of Challenge Accepted, the sermon is titled, The Cost of Compromise. Coming out of the gate strong, let's pray. God, I thank you that you give us ears to hear you. God, I pray today that you would give us a mind ready to understand. And we did not come as spectators, but we came as people of expectation. So God, speak to us today at West Houston, at Woodlands, at Katy, across all of our watch parties, our beautiful community in Tanzania. God, we came here for you. and We are here to receive. If you agree, shout amen. amen. So uh, when Jackie and I first got married, God had called us into full-time ministry. We were part of a college group that started with about 30 of us and we grew to a couple thousand and God had been working in and through us and I actually started in music. So songwriting, worship leader, ended up a worship pastor and God took us from renting vans to buying a conversion van. Come on, y'all, some of them conversion vans. Some good, good memories. And then we ended up buying a bus and we traveled all over the nation. Anywhere we could drive it in the nation, we went. We drove all over Canada, we flew internationally and we did that for years we just kept getting in the way of people's storms. Romans 2 verse 4 talks about the goodness and love of God drawing a man or a woman's heart to a place of freedom. So we'd go to all these amazing cities around the nation and, and, and talk to people about Jesus. And so we found that we really, really loved going to a state called Colorado. Colorado is beautiful. We learned to snowboard in Colorado. Our oldest son is named Brecken. Has nothing to do with Breckenridge, but I think subconsciously maybe a little bit. But now Jackie's a pro. Like when I tell you we took some lessons from an X Games winner for snowboarding, she just got it. Like just got it. She's like whipping down the hills and the blue black diamonds. And some of you are like, I don't even know what you're talking about. We have Galveston. We have hot heat humidity. So anyways, we used to love to go to Colorado all the time, and the air is super thin, but it's beautiful, and, and when we go to places like that, we want to adventure. We want to hike and climb and pick up snakes, and that's not true. The last part's not true at all. It's not true, but I remember uh, when we were on this trip, we were about to lead at this conference, and they were like, hey, Pastor Daniel, do you want to go, and uh, do you want to go four-wheeling with us? And I'm like, do not threaten me with a good time. Let's go. So there's about eight of us, and we are rolling along on four-wheelers, and they gave me the souped-up one. And they were like, listen, you gotta be careful with this one. It's pretty intense. And I'm like, man, <laughs> toss me the keys. Let's go. And I noticed that they were all kind of staying in the middle of the trail, and I don't know what was coming over me, but I was kind of hugging the edge a little too close. And I heard the guy behind me yelling, hey, how come the edge out too close? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I ended up catching the edge and it ended up going down the side of this short drop on the mountain and started rolling, tried to jump off and ended up falling down into this ravine and landed in this ditch. Y'all, I, I, I thought I got hurt. I see the four-wheeler like falling and it lands and I thought it was gonna land on me, but thank God the ditch, come on somebody, the angel of the Lord had his hand out. I don't know, but it ended up landing like kind of at an angle and didn't land on me. And I'm laying there, I'm like, I'm okay, <laughs> I'm okay, that's amazing. And look at how the Lord, how good the Lord is. My Yeti was still sealed and it was right next to me and I pulled it over and I still had iced coffee while I was waiting to be rescued. Like the Lord will provide in the middle of the, it was wild. So I'm down in this ravine and this was key. 
I had to call out for help. I needed somebody to show up because I hadn't created enough margin while riding on the four wheel, four wheeler. I didn't create enough margin between me and the edge and I ended up falling off and down into the ditch. Thank God that we have people, this is key and I'm gonna tie this together. It's amazing how in our humanity, we try so hard to just live our life right on the edge. And the thing is, the enemy's right over here, like, come on, come on over here. <laughs> come on over here, this is gonna mess up your entire destiny. Come on over here. And we like to just dance, we're like, oh, <laughs> ooh. <laughs> ah. <laughs> but what ends up happening is we end up falling into traps and schemes of the enemy. That's why this anchor verse is so key. When one man falls and is alone, he's in trouble. That's why we need people that will help us Again, we're in our challenge accepted series, but a little friendly disclaimer, not all challenges are meant to be accepted. So I end up finding myself in this ditch. Thank God for brothers who came and they were able to pull this four-wheeler off because it was way too heavy on my own. They helped get me out of there and I was like, I've got a story for a sermon, amen. I needed another one, like, but I was grateful. I was grateful for that band of brothers and said, thank God. And one of the guys with me said, man, I, I have a younger cousin who was hot rodding like you were. I was like, I don't know if it was hot rodding. He's like, it was definitely too much. And I was like, okay. And he said, man, he ended up falling down into this area that four-wheeler fell on, and we didn't find him for almost an entire day. So he's like, you're really fortunate. And then he said this, and I'm really glad that we were here. Look at the person next to you and say, you got a friend in me. Come on. But sing it. You got a friend in me. We need people in our corners. We need people surrounding us. That's why the men's night was so key. Gentlemen, when we have the next men's night, don't miss it. Show up. We need a band of brothers. Sisters, you all need friendships. You need people standing around you, those pouring in, you pouring out, and those standing with you. All right, so we're gonna go all the way back to the back, all the way to the back to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis, the very first book. All the way back, a little throwback. We're gonna go back to the very beginning because we're a Bible line by line reading church. Now, I love stories and I wanna talk about stories. All right, another story, same trip, Colorado, real quick. Now we're gonna get in the word. <laughs> we're staying at this cool little hotel. It's like a lodge and every room was creative. It was like a Harley Davidson theme and a fishing room scene. Jackie's like, Sk skip this story. It's not that funny. I'm going with it. I'm sticking with this story. I, they thought they were being creative. When I went to the bathroom to wash my hands, they had two soap dispensers and one said hand soup. I was like, Ugh. and I was like, they've just spelled it wrong. But the other bottle said, fancy skin milk. I'm like, oh, oh. So I called the front desk. I'm like, hey, I think you guys messed this up. She's like, no, we think it's creative. It's like hand soup. <laughs> we never stayed there again. It's not that funny. I'm gonna stick with it. I'm sticking with it. This isn't your time to preach. Leave me alone. <laughs> Hand soup. Y'all are gonna go home and change your soaps and call it fancy skin milk. Okay. Ooh, okay, Genesis. Let's get back. Focus all the way back to the very first book. Let me set this up real quick. We're gonna talk about two people, Abram and a man named Lot. Now, I talked about Abram, who became Abraham, the father of many nations, a few weeks ago in a message called Comfort Versus Courage. I encourage you to go back to our YouTube channel and watch that. Are you choosing a life of comfort? Or are you choosing a life of courageous faith? So we're looking at a man named Abram, who we know is Abraham. We're also looking at his nephew, Lot. Both these men find themselves in a blessed, favor-filled, increase-filled life. And for the sake of their workers and their livestock, they decide to separate. And as we study the text, we're gonna see two choices. Two choices that are made with two very different outcomes. So we're gonna start in Genesis 13. It'll be on the screens. A lot of Bible reading. I want you to grab this, verses one through 18. So Abram went up from Egypt to Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him as well. Verse two, Abram had been, become very wealthy in livestock and silver and gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, some call it Bethel, so the place between Bethel and Ai, not the Ai that's trying to take over the world. This is a different. <laughs> Where his tent had been earlier, verse four. He first built an altar there. 
Abram called on the name of the Lord. So he was growing in relationship. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land, because these guys were so blessed, could not support them while they stayed together. For their, position, their possessions were so great, they were no longer able to do life together. Verse seven, and quarreling arose. I feel like that's a word we need to bring back. And quarreling arose between Abraham, Abram's herders and Lot's. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at the time. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between our herders, your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. You know, they had like secret handshakes and stuff. It is not, is not the whole land before you. So this is the idea. Let's part company. If you go left, great, I'll go right. If you go right, then I'll go left. Lot looked around and saw the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zar, well water like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was near a city called Sodom and Gomorrah, which was full of wickedness. This is one of the cities that if you study the Bible, God actually destroyed this city. Scientists, agnostic and atheist scientists will talk about how something happened unexplainable where a large meteor destroyed the entire region. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 11, so Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. Two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, which was a blessed land, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and placed his tents near Sodom. Say near. I need you to remember that word, near. Verse 13, now the people of Sodom, I just talked about it, were wicked. They were sinning, it says this, greatly against the Lord. What's wild to me about the spirit of the age that we currently live in, if you go all the way back to Ephesians chapter one, in my Bible study, I've been walking through Ephesians with my group. Yeah, by the way, it's Connect Group Sunday, and not only do I talk about groups, but I lead a group, amen. All right, we'll talk about that in a minute. We've been talking about Ephesians where Paul is locked up in a dungeon and he's writing to the people and the church of Ephesus and he's warning them about the spirit of the age. Self-love, consumed by sexual immorality and all kinds of issues. A love for the government over God. This whole thing set in 80, 60, and 61. Y'all have heard me talk about this a little bit. Sure does look like 2023. All right, we'll keep going. So the Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north, the south, the east, the west, all the land you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. What an amazing prophecy. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and the breadth of the land for I'm giving it to you. So Abram went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron where he placed and pitched his tents, there he built an altar to the Lord. So you see Abram going and he's going back to what he knew as foundation, which was to build an altar, which was to worship God and give him praise for everything that God had done. What's wild is from chapter 13 to 14, Lot finds himself in trouble. For the sake of time, I'm gonna give you a little snapshot. Four kings rise up against the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, and a few others were allied with them. They raided the city, and they succeeded. They ended up capturing Lot. Boy, did you hear that whistle? That was intense. <laughs> what scared me. It's like they succeeded in their raid of the city. Unbelievable. They captured Lot. Watch this. They captured Lot, his family, all his possessions. Now, remember, Abram and Lot were both super successful. Silver, gold. Animals, blessings, increase in favor. They succeeded in their raid of the city. They took Lot, they took his family, all his possessions, and all the spoils from their victory. We're gonna read it in Genesis 14. The four kings took everything in Sodom and Gomorrah, including the food, and they went away. Lot, Abram's nephew, was living in Sodom. Now, Paul's. Remember earlier it says that he placed his tents near Sodom? That's key got right on the edge, got right on the line, and he placed himself near Sodom. But now it says in verse 12 of chapter 14, Abram's nephew was living 
in Sodom. Now, Sodom was one of those places what, what happens in Sodom and Gomorrah stays in Sodom and Gomorrah. So he was living there, and when they raided the city, they took him and all of his possessions. But a man escaped, reported all this to Abram, who's living near the sacred trees, belonging to Mamer and the Amorite, Mamer and his brothers, Ashkal and Anar. These are some wild words. Okay, verse 14. When Abram heard that his nephew had been captured, man, Abram went Jean-Claude Van Damme Abraham. Like, <laughs> now again, some of y'all are like, what did he just say? Like, that's old school. I know the median age of our church doesn't know who Jean-Claude Van Damme is, but <laughs> anyways, he was like, what happened to my, what happened to my nephew? So it says that he gathered all the fighting men, 318 in all, and he pursued the four kings all the way to Dan. There he divided his men into groups. By the way, it's group Sunday, even Abram. <laughs> Boy, that was good, okay. <laughs> he attacks them by night, defeats them, chased them as far as Hobah north of Damascus. He got back all of the loot, all of the possessions that had been taken. He rescued his nephew Lot and all of his possessions together and the women and all the prisoners. It's wild to me as we read in Genesis 13, it says that Abram lived in the land of Canaan where he set up an altar and worshiped God and thanked him for all. And you saw the favor on Abram's life. You saw where God was saying, hey, these are all the things that I'm blessing you with and I'm pouring, this is generational blessing. Where Lot lived among the cities and placed his tents near Sodom. It's amazing though, in 13 we see a simple act of just camping out near something ended up causing Lot to fall in it. Write this down if you're taking down notes. It's gonna help somebody. What you place yourself near, you'll find yourself in. What you place yourself near, that toxic relationship, you'll find yourself in. What you place yourself near, that questionable character, integrity decision for some financial gain, if you place yourself near it, you'll find yourself in it. Whatever you find yourself near, you'll end up finding yourself in we see that Lot was getting a little too close. And maybe in your own life, maybe there's some things that you're near but you're not quite in yet. So here's my loaded question for week one of Challenge Accepted. What are you putting yourself close to right now that you should be fleeing from? I've said this for a while. Anything that's pulling you away from God is not from God. I'm telling well, you, you just don't understand. She gets me. Is she pulling you away from God? You don't understand. He's just so smooth. Is he pulling you away from your relationship with God? I used to serve more, but then I got caught up in all of Is it pulling you away from God? Are you drawing away and clinging to something that you're near, that the enemy's trying to use as a foothold to get you to fall in it? We see the Apostle Paul and his experience and all of his wisdom take young Timothy under his wing. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, he takes Timothy under his wing, and this is what he tells him. He says, flee, flee. That means get away from. It doesn't mean like slowly just kind of walk away from it. No, get away. Flee from youthful passions. And this line right here is powerful. And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those that call on the Lord with a pure heart. What he was trying to express to Timothy was messing around with youthful passions will rob you of your purpose. And let me say this to everybody, this is key. You're lying to yourself if you think you can mess with the line and live on the edge and not fall in the traps of the enemy. Because here's the truth, I've said this for a long time, some of you, that if you call Hope City home, you can finish my sentence. I say this often, there is not a new demon factory creating new tricks of the enemy. That's why I referenced Ephesians earlier with Paul in AD 60 and 61, because the same tricks of the enemy that messed with great men of God and great women of God in the Bible are the same spirits that we're dealing with today. So for me, I got too close to the edge of the mountain in that area of Colorado, and I ended up in a ditch stuck under a four-wheeler because I thought I could handle it. You're lying to yourself if you think you can dance on the line. Yeah, but you don't understand. I'm strong enough. I read my Bible every day. You'll fall into it. 
No, but you don't understand. I'm, I'm a prayer warrior. I wear my armor every day. Awesome. But you'll end up falling into it. I'm telling you, if you don't have accountability, healthy boundaries, and people in your life that are checking you before you wreck yourself, it's absolutely important because you'll lie to yourself if you think that you can handle it. Because I've said this before, sin will take you further than you wanna go. It'll keep you way longer than you wanna stay and cost you way more than you wanna spend. Oftentimes, we don't fall into sin. We're led into it. That's what the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8. It's a heavy verse. Be alert and of sober mind. Now, people just say, well, I'm not a big drinker, so I get it. I'm always sober. <laughs> no, there's, there's all kinds of things that can intoxicate you. Success. Bathsheba. <laughs> the news, social media. You, you wanna know what you're consumed by? Check your screen time. Actually, I need you to bring your phones up. Let's look at them now. What? <laughs> Just kidding. Because if you're more consumed about learning song lyrics and TikTok dances, <laughs> what are you intoxicated with? What is drawing you away from and getting you living on the edge? And you're just near it, but a year from now we find out, what happened to so-and-so? Oh, he started living in it. He started falling for it. Be alert. That is a daily choice to be alert. It's not about getting your four shots of espresso, which is helpful, amen. <laughs> it is a beautiful thing. And of sober mind, why, why? Because your enemy, your enemy, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, and he's patient. That's why I said earlier, oh, oh she's getting close to the edge, oh, no, she joined that group, nope. Oh, he's getting close to the edge, no. He's actually on the dream team now. No, 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 he's getting close. No, he actually is starting to serve now on one of the serve projects on Saturdays with Hope City Missions. Oh, she's getting close to the edge. No, she had a friend in her life that said, girl, you know his reputation. You know that he's not good to all of these other girls. What's he got? Oh, you're so different? No, no, watch this. The enemy is waiting for who he can devour. He just needs you to get close to the edge and then he'll do the rest. Because the thing about boundary lines is they're often really hard to see. That's why we talk about blind spots all the time. Blind spots are called blind spots because you can't see them. That's why you need brothers and sisters in your life that are like, hey man, do you, do you know that you're late all the time now? <laughs> do you know that you're super sarcastic? Like out of the last three months, like all you, all you are is sarcastic. Do you know that you have no joy anymore? That you're super pessimistic? Like every day's a Monday. <laughs> just, just, man, I can't get ahead. Everybody else, like, do you do you realize that people avoid you when you walk into a room? Like, oh, get away from her. She's, ooh, Debbie Downer. I don't want to. Do you have people in your life that are talking like this to you, to help you with blind spots and boundary lines? You know, for ministry leaders, we talk about this. For business leaders, for leaders of your families, are you placing yourself? Watch this in compromising situations to make yourself relevant to a culture that God's entrusted us to lead? I had a great conversation with a group of guys Friday night, and we talked about relevance. We talked about culture, and I said, listen, uh, Jackie uh, and I, we, we, love, we love fashion, we love cool clothes, like I'm rocking the Chuck off-whites today with some windbreakers, hence the windbreaker pants. They make noise when I walk, like, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> But I was talking to them about relevance. I was talking to them about watching how my dad went from broken to breakthrough. Not because somebody thought, man, I'll just go hang out and drink with this guy, and I'll go hang out and shoot up with this guy. I'll go hang out and smoke weed with this guy. No, no, no. He was surrounding himself with guys who were gonna call him higher. Write this down. This is gonna step on somebody's toes. Relevance will never be as effective as righteousness. Relevance will never be as effective as righteousness because my dad, who was a broken man, caught up in all kinds of issues and rage and immorality issues and cheating on my mom and all of that, he needed brothers who were committed to being faithful to their own wives and families to call my dad up. He didn't need somebody that was relevant to his situation. He needed somebody 
We all need people that will pull us up and call us to a place that's higher, to lead us to a place of integrity and character that will push us towards, towards righteousness. If you need a way out, this is key, you have to seek godly friends. Don't keep putting yourself back in those situations. Check your circle, because if your circle's jealous of you, and your circle's not cheering you on and championing you, but your circle can also not be people that are just gassing you up all the time because they wanna internally watch you fall. Oof, that was for somebody. If you need a way out, you have to seek godly friends. We have to seek relationships and companionship that will help us get out of our mess. We have to prioritize righteousness again over relevance. Which brings me to point number two, community is crucial. Community is crucial. More than ever, community is crucial. I've talked about this before, but there was a TED Talk done, and this atheist was talking. He said, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in higher power. I don't believe in he said, but one thing I can't explain is people that wrestle with great depression and insecurity and even panic attacks, something shifts in them when they go serve with somebody else. When they stay home and they stay isolated and they stay in a dark place, it's, it's a struggle for them to ever get out of it. But man, when they go and they serve at a local mission, when they go and they help homeless folks get out of broken places, when they go and they hand out coats in winter seasons and soup and food to people that don't have anything, when they go serve, it changes things. And we understand in the Bible, it's because community is crucial. We know that community is crucial. That's why I go back to my anchor verse. Two people are better than one because they get more done by working together. So again, if one falls down, the other can help him up. But if a person falls into a spot alone, there's nobody, there's nobody there to help them. It puts them in this spot where the enemy can get in and the enemy can cause you to start questioning your purpose, your identity, who you are in Christ. So I wanna encourage you. We, this is Connect Group Sunday. And maybe God is stirring in you to not only be a part of one of our groups during our summer semester, but maybe God's been stirring in you that it's time to lead. Maybe God's been stirring in you to start a group. You could start a Chihuahua walking group. Come on. Now, there's all kinds of opportunities, and today I want you to go out. This is your challenge today. Every one of you will be handing one of these cool sticky note way out cards. I want you to pray about joining or serving and leading a group this summer. We have fall semester gonna be kicking back off. Where's everybody that was a part of freedom before? Come on, amazing. So our freedom groups will kick back off in the fall. But this summer, y'all, we have to continue to sharpen each other. Proverbs 27, 17 talks about iron sharpening iron as one man or woman sharpens another. The other thing is you can go through growth track and be a part of the community of Hope City and join the dream team. Make some noise if you're on the dream team, come on. I said this earlier, we have almost 600 folks serving faithfully across all of our campuses week in and week out. Y'all, we're better together. And this is the beautiful thing about community, is we all can't do everything, but we can all do something. It reminds me of a story. I've shared this analogy years ago. It reminds me of the story of this little girl who's about my daughter Daphne's age, probably six, maybe seven. She was walking down the beach with her parents. Her parents were a little further back. And the tide had turned over and started throwing starfish on the beach, but not like a handful, like an, like an epidemic, man. They were like everywhere. And she sees them, and she's picking them up and throwing in the water, and sees another one, picks it up, and throws it in the water, and she's getting a little overwhelmed. Her mom and dad are like, oh my gosh, look at her. She's so sweet, she's trying so hard, she'll never be able to save them all. And then there was this guy, you all know who I'm talking about. The guy's a little too tan, we don't know if it's Panama Jack or butter, that he is <laughs> slathered on, and he was like, <laughs> can't save all of those. It's a waste of your time. And I'm taking some creative liberty here. I feel like she picked up the starfish and said, listen, David Hasselhoff. <laughs> you know that guy standing there with his LED blinking belly button ring? You know what I'm talking about. It's just too much Axe deodorant spray. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Panama Jack. Y'all know what I'm saying. And he's, get, he's literally like just kind of 
being critical that this is a waste of time. Like, go back with your parents. Like, stop with this. Start. She picks up one and holds it up. She said, mister, I can't save them all, but I can save this one. She picks up another one and said, I can save this one. I can save this one. Y'all, when we gather together and we serve as a community, and we recognize that community is crucial not only to our personal growth, but to reach and help others. Yeah, we can't all do everything. but We can all do something. Come on, elbow the person next to you and say, man, that whole thing was for you. I can, and then look at the second person and say, you're the starfish. You're the, <laughs> you're the starfish. I'll throw you back in the water. What's interesting is, when we consider the text and we read about Lot, we see that Lot wasn't short on community. Day to day, he was actually surrounded by residents of the city. He was near it and then fell in it. What's wild is in order to be rescued, he needed someone who had distanced themselves from what he was experiencing. Proverbs 27, six says, faithful are the wounds of a friend who corrects out of love and concern. Who is that in your life? Who is that friend that can call you and say, hey girl, you okay? Hey man, like, can we grab coffee this week? Who do you allow access in your life that's not just gassing you up, but is actually checking you on things to make sure that you'll leave a legacy? Because it goes on, it says, the kisses of an enemy are deceitful because they serve his hidden agenda. Are you surrounded by people who will say what you don't want to hear out of love? I've got those people in my life. I talk about them all the time. They'll call me and talk to me, and then Jackie will Jackie will show up to the office and he'll be like, hey, guess who called? And I'm like, oh, man. Because if he's not feeling like I'm like, hey, man, I'm busy. I gotta go. Yeah, I'm good. Bro, I'm good. Trust me, I'm good. He calls Jackie and says, hey, is he good? <laughs> he just seems a little stressed. And then if she's almost like, yeah, yeah, hey, I, we're good. Everything's fine. We're busy. We got a meeting. The next person he's gonna call is Brecken. Y'all, if he gets all the way down to Fox, who's four, we're in trouble. <laughs> but this is the kind of accountability these are the kind of relationships. Do you have people in your life that can share things with you out of love? But sometimes there's a little bit of a punch to the nose. Or are you only around people that are hyping you up? So do this real quick. It's a little bit of a fun exercise across all campuses. Close your eyes real quick. Hold on to your purse. Nobody's gonna take it, but just be aware. <laughs> just be aware of it. I'm on one today. It's so funny. All right, check your circle. Close your eyes. Check your circle for a minute. If the person next to you is part of your circle, just be careful. But I said it earlier, but is your circle celebrating you or are they jealous of you? Is your circle calling you higher or are they dragging you lower? Is your circle drawing you closer to God? Is your circle uh, in, in, encouraging you to draw closer to the presence of God? Because if they're not, it's not worth it. Because community more than ever in the chaos that we're dealing with, with the wars and rumors of wars and the economy and inflation and recession and all the noise, who's in your circle? Who are you doing life with? I close, you can open your eyes. So community's crucial. I mentioned a second ago the challenge this week is to at least pray about joining or leading a group. But number three, this is the last one. This is great news. We learned this from Lot's story. Whatever has been taken can be restored. That's really good news. Jackie and I talked to a couple last night, and man, they were just in tears. They said, we needed this word. And they began to tell us about some things they had walked through. And I knew part of the story because he's actually in my Bible study. And, and he said, man, we needed this word because sometimes when you're in the middle of it, sometimes when you've fallen into a ditch, sometimes when, man, community isn't that important to you and you're just trying to do life on your own because I bet on me and I'm better on my own. And I've said this quote many times, if you wanna go somewhere fast, then go alone. You can go way faster. But if you wanna go somewhere far, you should go together. And he said, we learned today through Lot's life that whatever can be taken can be restored. Whatever has been taken can be restored in Genesis, we see that Lot literally lost everything, but thankfully, Abram shows up with 318 other dudes because of God's supernatural presence and God's supernatural power. It helped him get everything back. Got great news, y'all. God is for you. 
God is standing with you. And we have a part to play. We have a part to play, recognizing that we have to distance ourselves from the things that we've placed ourselves near. We have to recognize the importance of relationships and community. The last thing is, this is our part, Romans 10, verse 13. It says, for everyone. Who? Everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Another translation talks about being rescued, redeemed, restored, delivered. What has been taken can be restored. We just have to call on God. And maybe you're here this week and you're like, Daniel, it's a great inspiring message. Awesome. <laughs> it's great. Really appreciate it. But I'm way too far gone. You don't know the mistakes I've made. The mistakes I've made has put a lid on my life for the rest of my life. Maybe you think that your family is too fractured as a result of the decisions you've made or the addictions you've indulged. I've got great news. Yes, there's consequences we do have to walk out, but I'm a product. I'm a product of a man who for the first 10 years of my family and my parents' marriage ran around on my mom and for a lot longer than that dealt with drugs and alcohol and everything addictive. But now my dad's 71 years old and my kids know him as, as pop. My kids know him as a gentle, because he's a couple inches on me, a gentle giant. My kids will never know the rage and the anger and the chaos because they only see a man who's been redeemed, restored, and set free. God is in the business of deliverance. And everything that was broken, everything that was stolen, everything that was hurting in my mom, now 50 plus years later, they're still married. Every statistic that said they should have fallen apart, God caused with his supernatural power for things to fall into place. It's good. God offers a new beginning, and he offers the command over each and every one of us. Your sins are forgiven. There was a woman caught in adultery. If you're a student of the Bible, you know the story. These guys come to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, Rabbi, this woman is a sinner. Caught her in the act of adultery. I mean, that's pretty intense. And Jesus is like, okay. And they're like, the only way to redeem this sin is we have to stone her. Golly, that's intense. It was like from zero to 100. And Jesus is like, okay, now we don't know what he wrote in the sand. Bible theologians, some believe that he, when he leaned down and started writing in the sand, was writing the names of these gentlemen with the rocks. So this is, this, this is what Jesus says. Okay, so we gotta throw rocks at her. Cool, cool. Um, the first without sin. Go ahead, th throw, throw your first rock. Get your pet rocks out, throw them, throw them at her. And, and Jesus would lean down. He said, the one without sin, throw the rock. Okay, nobody yet? Okay, cool. And we believe he was leaning down and he was like, Jeffrey, cheating on his taxes. Go ahead, throw your rock. Brian, so I'm smoking behind that rock over there. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, throw your rock. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Some of you are like, is that really? Is that the message translation? <laughs> one by one, they drop their rocks. One by one. And Jesus says to her, where are your accusers? And says, your sins are forgiven. And then he didn't say, now girl, Go do you, girl. <laughs> Live your life, girl. <laughs> we know you love the dance of the clubs. Go do your thing, girl. No, no, no. This is what Jesus said. Watch this. Jesus, where, where's your accusers? Where are they at? Where are they all at? Oh, no, they also had compartmentalized struggles and sins. So he said, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. That commandment, go, that means get away from. Get out of the area that you're near that you're gonna find yourself falling into. Go and live in righteousness. Go and pursue righteousness. We see Jesus model this where our sins are not tolerated. I love Hope City because people can walk in one way, and this is what I guarantee, because we gather, Matthew 18, verses 19 and 20, we gather in his name. And this is not just a church of visitation, this is a church of habitation. So the Spirit of God is here. Before y'all even showed up today, the Spirit of God was already resting here. So when you walk in, every single time Jesus got in the way of somebody's storm, every time, 
He wrote victory in their story. So every time Jesus gets in the way because our sins are not tolerated, but because of his grace, our purpose is not terminated. He's the God of more than enough chances. Come on, how many of y'all are grateful that he gave you multiple chances because you know you never should have made it? Because Jesus gives us a directive, live holy, live righteous, and know that I can give you a fresh start. He's not looking for perfection. None of us will measure up to that. If you think you're perfect, then I'm gonna meet you afterwards because we have an altar call for liars. <laughs> Just do that right down here. Pray for you afterwards. We have a trophy and a whole deal to give you. It's really, really important to recognize the relationships and the circle and the friends you keep. It's more essential that you recognize the foundation and the relationship that you've established with your Savior. Because God can do great things with broken pieces. One more time, how many of y'all are grateful that God can turn your broken pieces into his supernatural perfect piece that covers everything? So here's the truth. Compromise will cost you. And when it comes to the wages of sin, there will be dividends to your decisions thing about the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God is there is grace for every goof up. There is mercy for every mistake. Would you close your eyes just for a moment? Maybe you're here today and you say, Daniel, wow, oof, if you wouldn't have had some humorous moments, I would have felt like you were just talking to me or stepping on my J's today. The, tr the truth is I, I have, I've gotten caught up in some things where I'm, I've kind of almost placed my life near something on the edge and I, I know that if I'm not more aware of this, I'm gonna end up falling into it. Or maybe you're the opposite. Maybe you have fully fallen into something that you placed your life near and it has caused devastation and destruction. Maybe it's robbed you of your joy, your confidence in your strength. Maybe that you've been, maybe you've been struggling to be a part of community and you recognize that it, the importance of community being crucial, but you're like, Daniel, the truth is, I found myself like Lot in the middle of this mess and I'm losing it all surviving. Today's a good reminder. Today's an alignment check. Because I've been drifting and I've found myself in a ditch, but today I want the Spirit of God to come in and I'm really excited about this last point. Everything that's been taken, everything, if maybe it wasn't a, maybe it wasn't a self-inflicted wound, maybe it was something that someone did to you, but God can restore deliver and he can he can bring back everything that has been taken he can restore it and I'm grateful for that today with every eye closed just for a moment would you would you do me a favor if today you would say Daniel there's some things in my life that I'm living in because I placed my life near it and now I find myself in it and I need to let go of it will you just open handedly just release that now would you just lift your hands towards heaven and just ask God to fix that and heal that and restore that and pluck that out like a weed. God, today, I thank you that you are just healing that. You're restoring that today, God. I pray, God, and everyone who, maybe there's something in your life that has been taken. Maybe that was something that happened to you when you were a child, and maybe you've been living with this mask, this facade. Maybe you have been living as a shell or a shadow of who you know you're supposed to be, and you're grateful for a God with enough mercy and hope to restore all that's been taken. You say, Daniel, the truth is I need some peace in my life where some things have been taken. Would you lift your hands if that's you? Right now, God, there's some areas of their lives, God, where they just need restoration. They need a breath of your spirit in, God, that you would restore hope today, that you would restore strength today, that you would restore some joy today, that you would bring some peace, God, where there's been broken pieces. God, I thank you for your spirit. God, you're not the God of condemnation, but I just pray for a little bit of, a little dose of Maybe a little conviction that says, hey, you're, you're teetering on the line, placing yourself a little too close to something that's gonna wreck you. And remind us today, God, on how to surrender that to you. Come on, if you receive something today, would you give God praise? Come on, if you feel like this word, amen. Everybody look at me real quick across all campuses. If you're here and you would say, Daniel, here's the truth, man. I, wow. This whole message, something has been stirring in me and convincing me of the fact that there's more to life than the way I've been living it. And I wanna give my life to Jesus. Here's what we believe at Hope City. 
We believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We're not a, universal, a universalistic approach where all gods lead back to one God. We believe what the Bible says, that Jesus is the only way. And according to Romans chapter 10, verse nine and 10, when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Slate wiped clean, sins is thrown far, as far from the east as the west. Everything that you have done, self-inflicted or things that have done to you, he can heal and restore. I'm proof of it. Born in an accident and almost aborted twice into a drug addict's home. I'm proof that God is in the restoration business. That he can take someone who was dismissed, disregarded, and said hopeless, like my dad, change the entire trajectory of our future. So the first invitation of the two is you wanna give your life to Jesus for the first time because you don't know him as your personal Lord and Savior. And check this out, this gift is free. It's been paid for in full. The debt that was owed by us, all of the stuff that we did, that we should have to pay for the rest of our lives, he paid the debt in full on the cross. That's really good news. And this gift is free. Jesus already paid for it. It costs you no money. If anybody has ever lied to you and said you have to pay for this, if you've ever watched somebody in the middle of the night on televangelists and they said you gotta pay for this, this gift is free. Jesus paid the ultimate price because he said you were valuable. He said you were worth it. Maybe the second invitation and you'd say, Daniel, here's the truth. That whole like uh, placing my life near something and falling in it, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that, that. Community is crucial, yeah, I've been, I've been running with the wrong crew. God restoring all that's been lost, I need that today because I got caught up in the prodigal life and I used to know Jesus, but today I wanna rededicate my life. Two invitations, first time salvation or rededicate your life. Close your eyes if you don't mind. Here, additional seating, Woodlands, Katie online. If you're online, just say yes to Jesus. Our amazing online H Crew team will help you right there. But today, I wanna know Jesus or I wanna rededicate my life. When I hit three with boldness, I want you to lift up your hand. Daniel, you're talking about me. When I wanna give my life to Jesus for the very first time, I need relationship. Two, I wanna rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, lift up your hand. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you and you and you and you and you and you and you. I see you in the back, I see you in the back. Come on, Hope City, there's hands that are going up everywhere. I saw you back there. I saw you, my friend. I saw you. I saw you. Come on, let's go. I see you. Amazing. You put your hands down. If you lifted your hand, we're all going to pray this prayer together. I want everybody, even if you didn't lift your hand, here's the truth. Maybe you didn't have confidence to lift your hand. It's okay. He didn't need to see your hand. He sees your heart. Let's pray. God, say this out loud. God, today... I'm deciding to choose to serve you, to live for you. I've been living reckless. It's just not working. I'm asking for forgiveness of all my sin, all my shame, and all my brokenness. Jesus, thank you for hanging on the cross for my life, even though I didn't deserve it. You did it because you said I was worth it. From this moment on, I will live for you for the rest of my life. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, can we give God praise across every campus? Let's go.